Before he died, Jesus prayed that his followers would be one, as Jesus was one with the Father, so that the world would know that he was sent by God. What you're about to witness is an unrehearsed dialogue conducted by a Protestant pastor with a Catholic priest in an effort to find the common ground between their two faith traditions and thus fulfill Christ's desire for his church. refer to you, by the way? You're nothing specialness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too young to be Father Ricardo. So Father John. Father works. John is what people around here call me. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Now, does anybody, when you're hanging out with people, does anybody, does anybody ever call you just John? People who knew me. Like your mother? My mother does not call me Father. Yeah. <laughs> um, she wouldn't think twice of doing that. Although uh, she, does, she does address her letters to my son, the Father. Oh, that's awesome. My mom's a, a remarkable woman who just writes like Paul did. Yeah. So I hold on to all her letters. Keep them close. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. My dad just died in uh, this past year, and, and I've been, uh, I have a, there's a wonderful woman from Kensington who's typing his journals hmm. um, for the grandkids and for everybody. It's just hmm. been such a treat. Yeah, to what a grace it. to see. Hmm. But um, I just want to thank you for your friendship. It is super exciting to serve Jesus Christ in Oakland County with you as a neighbor and a brother. In fact, I was thinking for people that are watching this video, I don't want to be true of, of Catholics, but of Protestants, probably half of them are hoping I'm going to stick it to you today, you know? Oh, yeah. Would that be true of the other, the oh, other yeah, way, no, too? I'm praying that I'll just really kind of give you one up or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sure there's an equal number, greater number, that are ho hoping that, uh, that we're friends. I think, and, uh, uh, I think the event we did, even as, you know, as much as small a first step as it was, I think it's going to go a long way yeah. just to knock down some walls, please God. I know it did here for a lot of our people. That's awesome. And um, please God, it did the same at Kensington. Well, I just don't want you to do too well today. I don't want to, you know, people moving wholesale. Coming back? Saying, yeah. Well, we've, we've reserved a set of pews <laughs> next week. So in case we've got some empty spaces, you guys can just come over here. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We'll send them over. Great. I'm really excited about this time. I just want to encourage you to feel free to man, say whatever, whatever's on your heart. Sure. L let me just begin by just being honest with you. And I think, because I don't want to hear your story as part of this, but I, when I, I turn, I know it's hard for you to believe this, but I turned 50 in May, this mm. coming May. And um, I grew up in a community in Memphis, Tennessee, but it was a community where it was a tremendous, we've talked about this before, but a tremendous mistrust, mm. unbelievable chasm between a, an evangelical Christian or a Protestant Christian and a Catholic Christian. Tremendous fear and mistrust. Did you have any any experience with that? Because your story is a little bit different than that. My story is very different. Yeah. I just turned 40 last year. And um, I grew up in a household that was, um, you could either say divided or united in different ways. Yeah. So my mom was Methodist. I got uh, four brothers and sisters. They. Um, three of the sisters left the Catholic Church, became really strong evangelicals. My brother and I stayed Catholic, although I stopped going to church for a number of years. And I just grew up in kind of the normalcy of um, people who went to different places who all love the Lord. That's, that's a, is that we were unusual? at each other's throats. Were you? I it's, mean, did you, you debate? Well, you have and, to be. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're passionate about this and you think you're right, and I'm passionate about this, and not so much that I think I'm right, but I think we've received the truth, then I think it just, it would be a lack of integrity if we weren't at each other's throats sometimes. Yeah. But that's okay. I mean, arguing isn't a bad thing. Unfortunately, arguing now just looks like two people screaming at each other with no, no prospect of receiving truth. Yeah, that's discouraging. 
because so, it means there's no truth. So did your mother, your mother? My mom became Catholic she, about 26, birth. seven years after they were married. So they've been, they've been married <laughs> So 50, she was going to do it, but it was going to take some time. It took a long time. In fact, it wasn't until John Paul was elected uh, that she became Catholic. She had a lot of concerns about Mary, the Holy Father, authority, all the, the typical hang-ups, you know? Yeah. Um, so she went to church every Saturday and Sunday with my dad, but she never went to communion. She never, she just never felt led to become Catholic. Wow. Two of my sisters have come back to the Catholic Church, but even you when we get to... You have one holdout. You have one I got one holdout. She's in Russia. Okay. Yeah. Um, but she's an extraordinary woman, her and her husband. I mean, they got great faith. So we share the Lord together. Um, we just have some issues. Yeah. But that's all right. So that was what I grew up with. That's cool. So when you left, why'd you leave? Was that back in high school or college? When did you leave the church? Um, I'd say roughly from like 16 to 24 or 5, I went to church really sporadically. Prayed every day. Always prayed. I've, I've had, I think, the supernatural gift of faith since I was a kid. Hmm. I, just, um, I just really know the Lord and really believe. Um, but I stopped living that way for a long time. So I just, I was one of those typical kids in their late teens, early 20s, who just wanted to walk a fence mm -hmm. and be both in the world and of it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was, so I pray in the morning, pray at night, usually prayed, Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do. <laughs> we called that prepenting. <laughs> prepenting, yeah. that's good, I've never heard that. It doesn't work, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, what was the turning point then for you? Just got tired of that life? Felt God calling you? You know, I, there, you? there was a couple things. I knew um, my sisters are significantly older than me, so the closest one is 10, she's your age. <laughs> Sorry, you're significantly Ouch. older than me. <laughs> um, so I'm 10 years removed from the closest sister. I'm six years removed from my brother. My sisters were all married by the time I was eight. So I saw them with their husbands and their families, and they were extraordinary models of Christianity for me. So between them and my parents, who are real saints, um, I always knew sooner or later that's how you're supposed to live and that they were really happy and they had something I didn't have mm -hmm. but I didn't want what they had yet and it wasn't until I was in, uh, in college I met a set of guys when I was in college at the University of Michigan who um, who just used to aggressively evangelize Catholics and Protestants together wow. would go around. so that's been my whole life and really mm -hmm. is working together and they would just target guys. I used to play basketball all the time, so they just target guys who played basketball or target guys who did this. And um, I got to know them. And for the first time, I think I saw real men who I admired, who were my own age, who loved the Lord, but who were normal and loved life. You know, yeah, who yeah. loved life. You yeah. know, the kind of guys who you know I could throw an elbow at playing basketball, and then afterwards we pray together. Mm. You know, or go sit down and have a pizza and a beer together or something. So there was. It was just a normalcy to faith, which is what I saw in my home, but I never found it with my peers. And you finally did in Michigan. Yeah, I found it there. I knew, I knew something had changed because uh, I remember walking really clearly to this day. I remember walking out of my apartment or out of my bedroom in my apartment where some party was going on. And um, it was as soon as I walked out the door and saw all the people doing whatever college kids do, it was like scales just came down. And I just saw it all and I went, there has to be more to life than this. And turned around and just walked right back into my room. And one of the people who lived below me kind of pounded on the door, you know, hey, aren't you coming out? And I said, no, I don't think so. I'm, this just looks really stupid all of a sudden. And that was when I think um, a whole set of events, that was one of them meeting these guys. God just kind of burst into my life. That is awesome, man. Hound of heaven. Yeah. Came chasing. I love that. I do too. Absolutely incredible. Well, I want to obviously give you a chance to address as many of the issues as we can today and really let you kind of kind of speak into to a bunch of these. And because of your Protestant Catholic mixed breed world that you lived in, for, there's a pr pretty unique perspective that you have that Dan Mountney has, that Dan Cobb has some of that too, but it's great, great to hear from you. When I was growing up, Many of us thought, you know, man, I just, I don't know if a Catholic is a real Christian. Did, were they, were, were Catholics thinking that about the Protestants? Do you think generationally, has is, is that always been an issue of looking at each other with that deep suspicion? I think my dad's, our, our father's generations seem to do that with each other. It's very um, hurtful. 
Yeah, it was. I was, uh, I was grateful I didn't learn that from my dad. My dad's my hero, um, as I'm sure yours is, huh? And was just, and is, an extraordinary model of faith and integrity, but he never taught me mistrust or hatred or animosity or bitterness or anything. It was more he just presented what he had as a Catholic man. And my dad was kind of an evangelical Catholic. I mean, my dad would read scripture every morning, so I, I just learned from my father that's, that's what a Catholic man does. He reads the Bible. Wow. So I don't understand people who say, who grew up in the church and said, man, the church never told me to read the Bible. Some Catholic traditions where people were actually afraid of the Bible. So yeah, it's afraid to read that, it. that's just totally well, antithetical to my experience because my dad's 81, so he's not, you know, in a recent generation. And he was reading the Bible every day. And, and not just reading it, but I mean studying. I mean, he had commentaries all over. He'd be, he's going to Bible studies. I mean, he led prayer groups. I mean, and my dad was successful as all get out. So that was a successful, normal, healthy man. That's, and he was Catholic. That's wow. what a Catholic man does. Tremendous. Years ago when I was getting ready to start Kensington, I was knocking on doors. And uh, occasionally I talked to, to Catholics as a part of that uh, who weren't going to church. And I would ask them, fascinating, I'd say, so what, were your, what are your concerns? What would you like the church to offer? And it was overwhelming. People talked about education, more, more Catholic schools. Of course, I didn't, I didn't have that exposure, but mm -hmm. I, I knocked on probably 1,500 doors. I talked to a lot of people, and that was, that was mentioned okay. as much as anything. And I think it continues for a Catholic, um, certainly my experience here at Anastasia and every place I've been, is the, um, there's just this ongoing desire to learn the faith. I think the, the gift that is kind of always transparent in Protestant churches, the ones that I've seen anyway, um, is there's so many opportunities to learn the faith, to study scripture, to get together, to do whatever. Um, that should be the norm in a Catholic church, but it's not, <laughs> unfortunately. So when people find a church that's doing that, it looks extraordinary when in fact all it's doing is the ordinary. I mean, you wouldn't think, I don't think you would anyway, that what you're doing is extraordinary. I'm just trying to respond to the gospel and do what we can to, to nourish people. Just trying to live Jesus up, let people exactly. encounter Jesus, yeah. And that's what we're doing here. And thankfully, the, the priests who have been here before me just kind of laid a foundation that people got accustomed to learning the faith, mm. and that's what happens now. So we just, there's a craving for people, because Catholics aren't taught in the same way as Protestants um, to wear their faith on the sleeve. Mm. And they've almost been, um, perhaps more so than, than many evangelicals anyway, they've, been, they've bought into the lie that my faith is private. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember as a kid. I remember my Catholic friends. It was, it was almost impossible at times. So even really close friends did not want to talk about that part of, of life. But, but I tell you what, I'm, uh, in the last 30 years, I've seen a tremendous change in the Catholic yeah. Church. People, I mean, an explosion of Bible studies and yep. people sharing. We have their, seven or eight of them here. So, I mean, it's obviously someone's reading the scripture. Yeah. And uh, I think that's great. And I think it's right in the last three decades in particular. And it just continues to grow, which is uh, wonderful. Hmm. I want to get into just common ground stuff. Like taking up a collection. Yeah, <laughs> let me let me let me do three real quick and just have you have you address them. Um, the Catholic Catechism. One of the big questions for Kensington cat people that have come from the Catholic Church come to Kensington or people we've interacted with. The catech Catholic Catechism really does talk about the fact that outside the church there is no salvation, and people wonder if they've gone to another church or whatever. Are they going to hell? Can they? Uh, are they still in in a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's yes. one of those, yes, period. Yes, I presume they're still in a relationship with Jesus. I yeah. don't have access to that. <laughs> but um, if they're still in a relationship with Jesus, yeah. Can, want to try to get into this real quick? Yeah, just give, give, me, give me a thought. Here's, here's the image that I have for the, what the church means by that. Because the church, would, the Catholic church would say that, that outside of the church, there is no salvation. That's a teaching of the church. Yeah. Now that lends itself to tremendous confusion, <laughs> obviously. It does not mean, exclamation point, um, that unless I belong to the Catholic Church and registered in a parish, that I'm going to hell. That's not what it means. The, the way, I, I'm, I'm visual, so this is the way I think of things. Uh, the church's claim is something like, here, here's a box, okay? And the box is the church. And inside the, the box 
the church's claim, is that everything that God can give us in its entirety to have access to him is found. So taken pretty seriously, 2 Peter 1, 4, that um, the Lord called us to partake of his own divine nature. That's what we're destined for, huh? Mm -hmm. That you and I are going to actually partake in the life of the Trinity. <laughs> wow. Extraordinary, huh? We believe that that actually happens here on earth somewhat, however uh, smallly in comparison to what it does in heaven, primarily through the sacraments. So in the box, if you will, and the sacraments are not our works. Sacraments are God's works. But in the box, the claim would be everything to have access to his divine nature is found. Scripture, teaching office of the church, moral exhortation, you know, understanding of judgment, all those things, okay? They're all found here. Okay. However, obviously I go down to, you know, Faith Lutheran or I go to Kensington, find an extraordinary love of Scripture, find clear understanding of the moral life, find, you know, clear understanding of the fact that I'm going to be accountable, all sorts of things. Hmm. Are they means of salvation? Absolutely. But the claim would be, but they came from here and they belong properly to the box because we believe that the Lord has one bride. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the claim, So, it, which allows the church to even say, that's why, and this is where the church will get accused of almost being too liberal by some Protestants. That's why we'll say that um, our Jewish brothers and sisters, do they have some of the elements that belong to the box? Yeah. Do they have the fullness of it? No. So, and, and I try to teach everybody as they're coming into the church, because um, I teach all the classes coming in, lest we think this is some claim of arrogance, um, it should be an indictment. Because if this is true, that the fullness of what God can give us to know Him and to have access to Him exists here, then I should be the holiest man on the face of the earth. Hmm. and I'm not, then we as Catholics should be the holiest people, should be the most alive people, should be the most energetic with our faith people. We should be the most transparently, transparently in love with Christ people that there are. We're not. So why aren't there more Catholics? Because of Catholics. Because <laughs> we're not living this. Yeah. If I really believe the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus as the Catholic Church teaches, then how do I walk up for communion the way people walk up for communion? put out their hand and just kind of lollygag out. Gandhi said once, if I believed that was the Lord, I'd be on my face. Mm. So that's powerful. Our, our behavior mm. is, my behavior <clears throat> is a scandal. Pope John Paul was always saying, you know, the world is, supplies to all of us, you know, Catholics and Protestants, the world's tired of our words. Mm -hmm. They want to see the life. Stephen Harris Chapman has that great song, you know, uh, they want to see the, what about the change? Mm -hmm. They want to see the difference Christ is making in me as opposed to just, do I know the right things to say? So that's the claim of the, the fullness of the means of salvation are, are to be found here. That's what we claim. You know, um, w when I was a boy, my, my strongest personal criticism of the Catholic Church was that it was just ritual, rote. People were mailing it in. As I got older, one of the things that... that <clears throat> was awakened to me is all of a sudden I realized that that was the temptation of every Christ follower, of every church, Catholic or non-Catholic, this continual temptation to just mail it in. All of a sudden, you're, it's, a, it's a statement or a set of beliefs, but it's contact with my own heart or my own behavior was lost. And I realized it wasn't a Catholic pro problem, it was, a, it was a human problem. That's right. What's, what is it, Psalm 136, over and over and over and over again, His mercy endures forever. It's every other line of the psalm. His mercy endures forever. It's rote, or it could be. Huh? But it's not, because as I pray it, my heart has to be involved. Jesus prays the psalms over and over and over again. Hmm. He certainly didn't pray them rotely. So, like you and I were talking before we started filming, the challenge for us huh, is to not get used to doing this. Mm-hmm and to just think we can wander into the presence of God willy-nilly. Huh? 
20, 20 years ago, Bill Hybels did a message called The Perils of Professional Christianity. And I never forgot it because it was that whole thing as a prof to be a professional Christian. What a disaster, you know, to mail it in. But then I realized every single person that's going to listen to this video has the same temptation to just go through the motions. And we've done it at times. I mean, yeah. we've all done it at times. You know, I mean, I pray an hour every morning in here in church before mass. And, you know, you can either pray and just, you know, walk out and check the box. I did that today. Or I can really meet the <laughs> Lord. And oftentimes it feels like all I did was check the box. Yeah. And so you just have to keep going, Lord, don't, you know, break through the darkness and shatter the deafness and just be with me. Help me to hear you. Um, let's, let's just finish up your, uh, just for the record, finish up your personal story. So you had this encounter with Christ and you really had the call to the priesthood. Kind of... Actually, I had a vision. Was it really a vision? Mm -hmm. What did the vision look like? You. Well, he didn't look like you, but I mean, <laughs> um, I'm 25. Actually, I had two events. 21 years old, just graduated from University of Michigan, trying to figure out what in the world I'm doing with my life. And all I knew was I was beginning to make some choices for the first time for the gospel, and they were beginning. I learned that the cross actually is heavy. Mm. Okay? And that it isn't all that glamorous sometimes to follow Jesus. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my career, huh, my life. Um, I'd just broken up with uh, someone I dated for a long time. And uh, my father was very successful, so he's trying to get me all these, you know, great interviews, although it's 1987, so it's not like it's a boom economy. You know? No, it's a bad time. But um, I'm leaving my dad, and he lives here in Birmingham, on my way back to Ann Arbor where I lived. And as I'm, uh, I just told my dad, you know, hey, I, in essence, told him, Dad, I'm really grateful for the hundred grand you just shelled out for my education in Michigan, but uh, I'm going to go work in a co-op and bake bread for a while because I don't know what God wants me to do. <laughs> and my dad, to his everlasting credit, says, um, Son, you can do whatever you want, and I'm going to bless it. He says, You can even be a priest, and I'd bless it. I'm like, Dad, I don't want to be a priest. Don't worry about it. So I'm leaving his house and driving back to my house, and um, you know Michael Card. Mm -hmm. uh, Love Michael Card. I'm listening to Michael Card on the way home and just praying. And uh, there's a song on the the album that dates us on called Scandal On. And uh, in the song, Card sings, uh, So come lose your life for a carpenter's son, for a madman who died for a dream. And you'll have the faith his first followers had, and you'll feel the weight of the beam. And as I heard that, I just started to bawl. I mean, just bawl. And I felt like my heart began to break. And as I'm crying, I'm on uh, M14 on my way to Ann Arbor, underneath Godfordson Road exit, exit 15. I'll never forget this. And I have a vision of the Lord right here in the car next to me. And it was, it was obviously him. <laughs> and as I look at him, he's just kind of staring at me. And then at a certain point, he's sitting in the passenger seat near me. He just sticks his hand into my chest and he says, John, these are all your dreams, all your goals, all your desires, and everything you want to do with your life. And I said, that's my life, Lord. He says, I'm going to give you my dream, my goal, my desire, and what I want you to do with your life. And he was gone. I was 21. I spent the next three and a half years wow. vacillating between really devout life and scared out of my brain. It's like, no, you know, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah goes to Spain. I mean, that, I was Jonah. Then about four years later, I'm 25. I'm back in the world. I'm working at uh, Ford, living in Ohio. Still can't figure out what in the world I'm doing with my life. Frustrated as I'll get out. I look like I've got everything. I feel like I've got nothing. Often I'm praying every day, but I'm not living a great life. About ready to go back to get my MBA, which doesn't excite me because all it's going to do is give me money. I grew up with a ton of money. Money didn't make me happy. So I used to bring my Bible with me to work every day. So I open up my Bible and open up to Matthew 19, you know. So I'm, I'm reading Matthew 19 and Jesus' words that some men are born eunuchs, some men are made eunuchs, some men make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. He who can accept it should accept it. And it, and it wasn't, you know, one of those experiences where the words leapt off the page or something, but as I read it, it was one of those experiences that we've all had where 
as you read it, you're just like, oh, <laughs> you're talking to me. Mm. You and, knew that when you read Oh, it. I knew it, clearly. And I had my Bible in my hand. I almost threw it on the ground because I was so frustrated. It's like, Lord, I don't get it. You know, I was almost married. That didn't do anything for me. I thought of living single. I spent some time with this community of guys that helped evangelize me. That didn't do anything for me. Great men, but I didn't want to live single my whole life. Then I was dating again at this time, and I'm bored out of my mind again. I thought, what's left? And like I can hear this heater in our church right now. I heard a voice just say, John, I'm inviting you to live single and to do it as a priest. And I went, you've got to be kidding. I don't know anything about priesthood. And I don't want to be single. You know, I want to be married. I want a wife. I want kids. So I just said, and I knew that, was, that couldn't have been me because I don't have a desire for this. So I just said, Lord, if that's really you, then you've got to give me desire because that's not what I want. And that took two days. It was like a Wednesday. I woke up Friday, and I just knew. I knew, much like when you met your wife, I know I'm, I'm going to marry that woman. I knew the day I woke up, I know why I'm alive. To do this. Yeah, I just found the reason why I'm alive. Hmm. And it's extraordinary to know that. And I knew nothing about priesthood. I knew like maybe two priests my whole life who I thought anything of. So all I knew was, I mean, I read scripture all the time. So my image of priesthood was Paul. Hmm. So, all right, this is, this is what a priest looks like. Yeah. So that's just how I've, that's, that was the encounter that just changed, those two encounters in particular were what changed everything. And both of those were the days when when you realized this is what you were born to do. Yeah, the first one, I mean, just like Paul would say, you know, this happened in three days, you know, he's blinded, and then three days later he meets Ananias and the scales come off, or he's, his eyes are open, however it is. So for me, that's what this seemed like. It was like this, even though these were years apart, this was one event that was stretched out over time. Yeah, yeah I understand and, that. And, and I remember I went to seminary in Rome, and <clears throat> I remember praying in the chapel one day, and I'm, I'm just looking at where the Lord had brought me, how he'd brought me to this place. And I'm remembering the vision. I'm remembering a lot of things in my early life. I'm remembering the vision. And then I remember um, the voice later and, and a conversation that I'd had right before I left for Rome because the last thing we had to do was get a physical. And I'm a typical man. I hate doctors. No offense. And uh, just don't like them probing my body. <laughs> so I, uh, <laughs> it's like the week before I'm supposed to go. And I really don't want to go to Rome. They'd asked me to study in Rome and everything's in Italian. I didn't know Italian. Um, I didn't want to go. I'm, I'm close to my family. I wanted to be here. So um, I go for a physical, and the doctor's looking at my heart, you know, because my dad's had some heart problems. He says, um, you know, something's a little, just a little wacky in your EKG. Why don't we, why don't we have it checked out tomorrow? So I go, okay. So we go, and we do some tests in my heart, and as they're doing them, it looks fine. And, and underneath, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. I'm going to be like Abraham. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up Isaac. I'm going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go to Rome, and you're going to give it back, and I'm not going to have to go. <laughs> you're going to find something with my heart. This is great. So I'm really thinking this. So I go, I do some tests, and they say it's fine. Then I get a call the next day. I used to run 40 miles a week, you know, so I get a call the next day from some nurse saying, hey, we need you to come in right away and do a stress test. I thought, a stress test? I'm 25 years old. No, we found something on your heart. I go, okay. So I just got done running. I go to the hospital, do a stress test. I broke the machine because I couldn't get the heart rate up high enough gets done, come back late in the afternoon, doctor looks at the records and he says to me, um, you can go to Rome. He says, but um, did you ever have a childhood illness that like threatened your life? And I said, why? He says, because you have scar tissue on your heart and I can't figure out where it would have come from. Hmm. So I'm in the chapel in Rome praying about all these things. And I hear that voice, the doctor's voice again. I thought the Lord just said, you know what, you might have had an illness when you were a child, but the scar tissue on your heart is my hand. And I own you. Back to so that like Paul says, car. absolutely, it's Paul's description in Philippians. You know, I, I strive to take hold of the one who has taken hold of me. Yeah. And... Um, would that I would always remember that he owns me, but I know he's taken hold of me, so I got to try to continue to strive to take hold of him again. Huh? That's awesome. So you studied in Rome. How long were you in Rome? Four years. 
How's your Italian, Ricardo? It's uh, pretty good. <laughs> Actually, it's passive Italian again now, you know. The name was Ricciardi, Multiani Fa, many years ago. But my grandfather got to New York and they couldn't pronounce that. So it's like, okay, you're Ricardo. Now everybody thinks I'm Cuban. So, no, I'm not Cuban. I'm Italian. And um, so I, I never heard anybody say, hey, has anybody ever called you Ricky? <laughs> no, you're the first. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you, you learn it because you're immersed in it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're sitting there for months going, you're going to test me on this? <laughs> you got to be kidding. But uh, it sinks in. So you came back. Did you come back after the four years? I did. Came back, uh, ordained in 96. So I was ordained a deacon, actually, in St. Peter's. And I'm ordained a priest back here in Detroit uh, by Cardinal Maida uh, in 1996. I was here at a parish in Dearborn for three years, and then uh, they asked me to go study again. They, they keep sending the dumb guys back. So I went to Washington to a, a place called the John Paul II Center mm -hmm. for studies that. on marriage and the family. It's not the one that's in the paper right now that's Different in one. debt. That's no, yeah. not the one. Ouch. Yeah. Oof. Um, you're not talking about that one today. Uh, this was uh, actually the, the Pope, the day he was shot, was about to announce that he was intending to found an institute on every continent in the world to teach and proclaim God's plan for marriage and family. So I went to the one in Washington. It was a great experience. Came back after a couple of years and um, worked in a marriage and family center out in Plymouth, and now I'm here at St. Anastasia in Troy. How long have you been here? I'll be two years in June. And it's been a great run. I love it here. And I'm just saying that from other people, I, uh, from people who have been blessed by being a part of this in your leadership. I'm glad to do it. and to. It's, Great place, very alive. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk about common ground. Okay. Obviously, is uh, some people are hoping there isn't, <laughs> there isn't any, any, so we can be mad at each other. What is the What is the common ground in our faith, as Catholics and Protestants? It might be easy to say what isn't, you know, and we can get into that. I mean, aside from those kind of particular issues, what's the common ground? We're creating the image and likeness of God. We're saved by His precious blood by the Word made flesh. Um, I'm saved by grace alone. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. called to live a life that is uh, one that clearly shows forth that uh, we belong to Him. We're called to proclaim the gospel. Um, we're called to send out, to go out into the world and tell the nations. I mean, what is in common? I mean, aside from the things that I know you got in your list, yeah. I think people are shocked. To re I mean, I know people were shocked at Kensington when we, when we were talking about how we're saved by faith. The Catholics are probably shocked too. I mean, that we as Catholics can say we're saved by faith alone, so long as we understand what we're talking about. Yeah. So there's lots and lots. It's exciting, man. It is really exciting there, to know what we share is, in common. Absolutely, because we have so much. While we have real issues where we're where we can argue, we also have so much misconception about what the other thinks. Mm -hmm. Huh? And my experience, anyway, is, is certainly in my family. Uh, is that very few Catholic or very few non-Catholics hate what the church teaches. They hate what she thinks or what they think she teaches. Yeah. So, um, so you, you believe, so we worship the same God. We honor the Trinity. We do, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the finished work of Christ. It has been done once and for all. That's awesome. You love God's word. You've always talked about grace through faith. Now, in, in fact, let me talk about God's Word just real yeah. quick, because I, I have to help Catholics understand how much we love God's Word oftentimes. Huh? There's a great line in, in um, what's known as the Second Vatican Council. Um, what the, church would hold, the Catholic Church would hold is one of these ecumenical councils, which follows in the history of Nicaea, which all you know, people who've read the Da Vinci Code know a little bit about these things. <laughs> um, so at Vatican II, there's a document on Revelation, how God reveals himself. And one of the lines at the very end of this document, it's a short document, it says that even as the church venerates the body of the Lord in the Eucharist, so she venerates Scripture. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a powerful image for a Catholic. So a Catholic walks in, sees a tabernacle, and genuflex, huh? Because we believe that's really the Lord present there sacramentally. So we should have the exact same reverence for Scripture. So like I tell Catholic, you should never have your Bible on the ground. That's God's Word. You don't put God's Word on the ground. Um, we're building a, you know, I've, I've seen a chapel not too long ago. We're going to build one here, and it's got uh, two niches in the back of the chapel. One's for the tabernacle, for the Eucharist for us, and the other's for Scripture. 
so that people can see the symmetry of these things. We're fed, the Catholic Church teaches, by the two tables of the Lord, his body and his word. So great reverence for scripture. But in, in that, there has been a movement, it seems like the last 30 or 40 years, where Catholics are more excited to not just venerate it, but to really know it. Well, that's what I mean by absolutely. Engage in it. That's the veneration. Right. I mean, venerate, I don't mean people on their knees going, oh, we worship the Lord. That's not what I mean. So you're right on. Um, I think in recent years, it's picking up steam still. You know, there's been, and it's often driven by non-Catholics who've become Catholic, who've brought into the Catholic Church. Man, you guys don't have a clue about the richness in God's Word. So they start leading scripture studies, and the Catholics are going, wow, I didn't know that. And so all these things that the Catholics were never able to explain, they come to find out, well, that's right there in scripture. I didn't know that. So, yeah, there's been a great growth in enthusiasm to reading scripture, and that's what we mean by venerate it. It's a so, part of our life. Just so we're absolutely clear, let, let me ask you this question, then you just you answer it however you want. The misconception is you can work your way to have heaven the whole issue of grace through faith in Jesus. Do Catholics believe you can work your way to heaven? No. That, that was the whole gist of this letter this woman got, who was trying to, who was, who was coming into the church yeah. and someone was trying to, you know, don't you understand what you're doing? You're gonna go into this whole works place that they're gonna save themselves. I can't save myself. I'm saved by Jesus' precious blood, period, end of story. But I have to respond to it. So. We would both say, without a whole lot of having to hash this out, that we're saved by grace alone. Huh? You would also say you're saved by faith alone, I would presume. Yes. And I would tell you, we can say that too, that we're saved by faith alone, so long as we understand what we're talking about by faith. And this is, so faith in the kind of the secular vernacular looks like, um, yeah, I agree that two and two is four. So it's just this adhering mentally to a proposition. But that's not faith. You know that. I know that. That's just intellectually assenting to a truth. Faith is clinging to Christ. Yeah. That's faith. Hanging, huh? on. Hanging on to him. A response. Ah, it's a verb. So it's, it's action. an action. Yeah. Did that save me? No. I mean, not in the sense of it wasn't my work. It was his work on the cross. Huh? So it's his action on the cross which saves me, which I have to respond to. Now, if he doesn't do it, I got nothing to respond to. So I'm saved by his work alone, period. But I have to cooperate with that. I've got to welcome into my life, and I've got to do it every day. Just like you and I were talking about yeah. with prayer, that it can get wrote. I think that's a great perspective. I think that's one of the things that, that Protestants need to, to, to see and understand, that the response, you're not responding to try to earn favor. You're responding out of the goodness of God, right? Absolutely. I, I love... Um, Saving Private Ryan. It's one of my favorite movies. I think it's a, the ending of it, I think, is this extraordinary scene for Christianity where this man is standing at the front of a grave, a, a headstone, which is a cross, huh? Who saved his life. He's there in the beaches of Normandy. Mm -hmm. And he has a flashback. This whole movie is a flashback where he's recalling how his life was saved. And the very last scene before it fades out is the man who saved his life grabbing him and whispering in his ear, earn this and then it fades out and there he is standing in front of the cross mm. and it's a great scene the difference obviously is Jesus doesn't say to you and me earn this he says respond to this mm -hmm. you got to accept this you got to receive this you got to make your whole life not an hour once a week or Wednesday night and Sunday morning your whole life a response to what I've done for you on the cross mm. that's powerful it's really cool I love that image so I can't work my way to heaven. Mm -hmm. Social issues. Um, in the last 35 years in America, as America has changed, Catholics and Protestants find themselves shoulder to shoulder on a lot of issues that we really are together on. What, what would you say some of those are? I would say first and foremost is abortion. More than 40 million people killed people more than 40 million people not blobs of tissue not potential people people human persons because you got an either or choice here either all human beings are persons or only some are and if it's only some 
who gets to make the rules and what criteria do they use? Mm. So, yeah, we're facing a, a tragedy there, huh? Um, a marriage is obviously one that's, uh, that's becoming more and more troubling. Just what is marriage? God's word seems to be pretty clear on what marriage is. Unfortunately, the answer to that in trying to dialogue with the world doesn't seem to be a sound bite, you know, because it doesn't do any good to tell the world, well, this is what Scripture says, because the world isn't listening to the authority of Scripture anyway. So is there a way that we can uh, present what Scripture says by trying to appeal to the reason, and the fact that God gave you a brain, <laughs> if you use it and you think, you might be able to find truth. So how can we lay out what the Lord reveals in Scripture in a way that is attractive to people, helping them understand what the truth is that's revealed in the Scripture? Mm. That's a huge issue for us right now. What about the poor? <clears throat> Absolutely. The Catholic Church would say that she's always had a preferential option for the poor in the sense of, I mean, Jesus doesn't look anything like you and me when he walked the earth. He doesn't own a home. It's a nice sweater you're he wearing. He doesn't have a car. It's a great sweater. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's very warm. It's very comfortable. I love it. Um, he doesn't look like us. And I, mean, I look through my closet, and I'm, I'm, I'm a single man, for crying out loud. I'm a celibate, consecrated man. I got far too many clothes. I go through it twice a year to get rid of clothes, and I still got too many clothes. I mean, how many clothes do we need? I mean, our brothers and sisters in Detroit don't have anything, and they're sleeping on the street. So, should have a, I mean, am I my brother's keeper? Yes. The answer is yes. Absolutely, I am. So, um, I, I hope that that will continue to grow for both of us, you know, uh, um, both Catholics and Protestants, that we really will recognize that is, as Mother Teresa would say, that's Christ in his distressing disguise. Mm. It's a great line. Mm -hmm. So, well, it seems like that the world press always downplays the compassionate side of Christ's followers. The overwhelming compassionate response in this world is from Christ's followers. You don't see that. The United States is the most, we're a paradox, huh? We're at one and the same time the most hedonistic, selfish society that there is, and the most generous in the world. And the generosity is driven by you know, Christians, whether they're Protestants or Catholics. Totally. Um, it's not that Jewish people aren't given, but I mean, we take seriously the Lord's command that so often as we did it to one of the least of our brothers, we did it to him. So. Well, it's where you see Jesus too. That's what people at Kensington the last five, 10 years have really, they realize that's where, it's where you see Jesus sometimes more clearly than anywhere else. Yeah, and, and Anastasia, we, we've kind of hooked up with a downtown parish in Detroit, St. Aloysius, in a particular way. So people go down there, work in the soup kitchen, they work with the homeless, they work with, uh, you know, the impoverished of different kinds. And I think we all leave, I'm sure you, your experience of being over in third world countries and mine too, as you're working with people, you say to them, you know, I'm sure it's far easier for me to see Jesus in you than it is for you to see him in me. I mean, you just kind of reeking of the Lord, and I'm, I don't know what I am. You know, I have two, two Christian brothers, Julius Murgor, who's a Pocot tribesman, and Jaya Sankar, who's a Telugu-speaking Indian pastor in Eastern Andhra Pradesh, and I, I just tell them, I said, these guys are my heroes. These guys are the guys that I look to. They're my mentors, my heroes. They're getting it done. And uh, I, I really, I stand in awe of them. Yep. It's wonderful to see. Yep. We have a priest here with us who's from India, who's just kind of on sabbatical for a couple of years. And, you know, he tells stories about what he does, his normal priestly life for the people in India. And, you know, five o'clock morning services, so people can go out into the fields and whatnot. And, he, you know, he'll walk or ride his bike through the mud. And I'm just... Well, welcome to the United States. Here's your car keys, brother. You know, <laughs> you're going to like it here. <laughs> you're going to love it. Okay. You're good, man. It makes me want to come to church here. Door's always open. <laughs> I'll come to yours. Um, over and over, former Catholics who attend Kensington say this. You've heard this 
and, and, and a million times and I want you to respond to it. I was born and raised Catholic, attended mass for years, but I didn't find Christ in the Catholic Church. I didn't meet Jesus until I started attending Kensington. What are your thoughts about that? Because you've heard that. Yeah, I, I heard it from my sisters, you know. Um, and I think from, from my sister's perspective and from others that I know, um, it was true in the sense that when they came to Mass, maybe they weren't listening, maybe they weren't interested, maybe the Lord hadn't moved in their life in the way that He had later, then someone comes along and invites Him to some place. And it's different, you know, because the Mass is the same. I mean, it's a, it is a ritual, That's right. intentionally so. And now I'm in something new, and it doesn't look like the same thing all the time. And my antenna are up, perhaps in a way that they weren't. So, I mean, my response to that would be, you know, I'm sorry that you didn't have your ears open here, but, man, I'm grateful that you're, you're hearing the Lord now. I would have sorrow in the sense that I feel like you've, you've walked away from the Eucharist in particular, and we'll talk about that. But, man, I'm, I'm glad you, you have the Lord in the way that you have him now. I mean, you can't come to Mass and not hear God. The whole Mass is Scripture. You know, we have a reading from the Old Testament. We have a psalm. We have a reading from the New Testament. And we have a gospel. That's the first half of the... I mean, the Mass is an hour. Someone said that the Mass has to be an hour because if it goes over that, people leave. They walk out. So somehow there's this unwritten rule that the Mass has to be an hour. <laughs> so the first half hour of the Mass is all Scripture. That's all it is. Uh, you know, long reading some Scripture and then an exhortation from it. So, I don't know, how do I not hear the Lord there? But somehow, the, differ the difference, one of the things that I've observed, God's made people so differently. And um, sometimes when I think when people tell me that coming to Kensington, it's simply saying, you just happen to bump into a place where it's an, an expression that hits you where you learn, where you respond to God. Yeah, and I, absolutely, and for that I'm grateful. And I think, if, this will get into the differences here, unfortunately. So when we think about um, people who met the Lord after they left the church, <laughs> um, I think one of the things that's been really helpful for me to realize is I've come back into the church, um, is that I, th I think we tend to have a different perspective on why we're going to church to begin with. And for me, I've just come to realize you're talking now the difference between Catholics a Catholic and, and a Protestant. Look at exactly. it. It's one of the differences. So, I mean, I can pray anywhere. You know, I, don't have to, I don't have to be in this church to pray. I don't have to be in, a, in the middle of a Catholic mass to pray. I don't, I don't have to. I can, Jesus says, close your door and go to your inner room. So I can pray anywhere. I mean, the world is his cathedral, so I can pray in the middle of nature. Mm -hmm. And we find him there often, huh? But I, as a Catholic, I come to mass not so much because of what I want to give to God, I come to Mass more because of what He wants to give to me. And what He wants to give to me, we believe, is Himself. So that's why the, the challenge for the, the Catholics who've left the Catholic Church or, and, the, and the challenge for the Catholics who are in the Church, just like it is for you guys because you're so big, is Sunday can't be sufficient. I got to get involved, right. you know? I got to know there's a Bible study going on Tuesday night, that there's a Bible study going on Wednesday afternoon at lunch, that there's opportunities for a prayer meeting over here, that there's all these different um, complementary services which give me the opportunity maybe to express my faith in a different way than what I can in the middle of a ritualistic service. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that when I was growing up. I thought this was it. I thought that, I mean, what does a priest do? He works for an hour a week for crying out loud, you know? <laughs> well, I come to find out differently. Um, so, f you know, for us, as we're thinking about, as Catholics, when I'm thinking about the Mass, um, the Mass is, we would say, fundamentally a revelation of love. So, it's this pendulum swinging back and forth between God and us. God speaks. We hear and we respond. But love, and you're a married man, isn't content with giving information. 
I don't want to just tell you that I love you. When a man and a woman love each other, and when two people love each other, they give each other things. You know, I send you notes, I write you a card, send you flowers, bought you candy on Valentine's Day. And a husband and a wife give themselves to each other in the act of marriage, whereby two become one flesh. In the, in the Catholic Church, the mystics and the saints for centuries, almost from the beginning, have seen that that's the best image to help you understand what's going on in the Eucharist. That God loves us so much, He doesn't just tell that to me. He's not content to give me information. He wants to give me Himself tangibly under this sacramental sign. So this, again, the sacraments are His work, not mine, whereby He So draws you're not taking credit for those, there's no credit to be taken for the sacraments. No, the, the sacraments, we would They're grace. We, sacraments are pure grace. They all flow from the efficacy of the cross. Yeah. They, they, we would say they have the power of Christ's death and resurrection in them. Because the question becomes, how do you and I get access to the cross? H how does one actually get into contact with Christ's event on the cross? And the Catholic Church would say there's two ways. Faith and the sacraments. Is faith a real access to the event of the cross? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, well, so then why the sacraments? And the church's answer would be, because somehow it's fitting for how God has made us, meaning you and I aren't angels. We're not pure spirits. Mm -hmm. we're, a, we're, a, we're a mix huh, of body and spirit. I know you know Hebrew, so we're nefesh. Huh? I mean, we're, we're body, soul, one, one together. You can't demarcate them. So we're living in this kind of messed up Western world, which tends to look at the human person dualistically. That's why we kill children. That's why we kill the elderly. That's why we kill the handicapped, because we can help you by killing you. Mm. I don't know how that happens. It only happens if we have a dualistic view of the human person. But we're not dualists. I mean, I can, you can prove that by slapping me. If you're going to slap me, you're not trespassing against my property. You're trying to hurt me mm -hmm. when you do that, huh? So. We are one, we're this body-soul mix, and somehow the church would say it's fitting or, or appropriate to the nature with which God has made us that he would interact with us precisely through matter. He became flesh, after all, mm -hmm. so that's not beneath him. Right. He took his flesh with him back to heaven, so it's still not beneath him. He's ascended gloriously with his risen body into heaven. And St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the great uh, teachers in the Catholic Church said once that man's estate is somehow to be enslaved to material things. That's, that's how we are now by the fall. We, t we tend to be, we tend to try to find happiness in things. Yes. Huh? Mm -hmm. As opposed to in him who is the giver of all things. So St. Augustine once said we're like, we're like brides who wake up the day after their wedding looking at their wedding ring going, wow. <laughs> that's a great ring. And they forgot the guy who gave the ring. Yeah. Well, that's how we are. We're surrounded by God's gifts. That's a great But image. they eclipse the giver. Mm -hmm. So hmm. the church would say, so somehow God sees it fitting to hide himself in material things, which man is intended or inclined to reach out for so that man can be healed of his slavery, hmm. which I think is a beautiful image. That's amazing. So when you think of that in terms of the Eucharist, you reach out for the bread, and you're really you're reaching out for Christ. Yeah, we would say that it is, it's more that he's offering himself to us, okay. like, like a bridegroom, which is one of his favorite images in the New Testament, huh? offers himself to a bride. Isaiah says more than, or the Lord says through Isaiah, more than a bridegroom longs for his bride, so do I long for you. Well, that's a pretty graphic image of union. That's this glimpse of, I mean, God, you know, it's like C.S. Lewis used to say, we're all like little kids playing in the house, you know, pretending there's a ghost, and then all of a sudden we hear a noise and go, what was that? I mean, that's how we are with God. We all want God to love us, and then the moment we find out how much he loves us, we're like, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding. God's love is no joke. And as he gave himself for us on the cross, very physically, so we believe as Catholics that he continues to give himself, not as he gave himself on the cross, that's sacrifice done once for all, but as a lover, 
who wants to join his bride to himself so that everything that he is can be ours. That's why we love the Eucharist, because it's him for us. It's not an image of him. It's him. And we love him. That's powerful. Um, one of the things that Protestants are really weak on is, a, is, the, is the symbolism. But that's, that's, a, that's a huge part of experiencing Christ within the Catholic Church, isn't it? Yeah, I think sometimes we, we, it comes from, you know, we're going to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And we thought that that meant whitewash your walls. But I don't know that that's what Jesus meant. It's certainly not what, um, what the early church thought. I mean, I remember taking my sisters through the catacombs in Rome, you know, first century catacombs with frescoes everywhere. And they weren't whitewashed. I mean, they, were, they had depictions everywhere. And again, it's because of this fact of that's our nature. We encounter reality through the senses. Mm -hmm. We all know that, you know. Lovers encounter each other through the senses. God continues to reveal himself to us through the senses. Can he, can he break directly through to me? Yeah, has he done that with us? Of course he has. So the senses help us. It's like, why do I have a picture of my mom and dad on my desk? Why would I have that? Well, because it reminds me of them. I love my mom and dad. You know, it, every time I see it, I'm, I'm reminded of their love for me, their heroic witness of love for each other. I don't worship them. But I have, a, I have a picture of them there on my desk. So for us, with the things that we have here in the, in the church or in any Catholic church, those are things which remind us either of what the Lord has done for us, first and foremost, um, or they remind us of, uh, of images of the saints. We don't worship the images of the saints, no more than I worship the image of my parents on my desk. Mm. But just like that kind of reminds me of the reality of my parents, so the images remind me of, ah, Lord, help me to be great like they were. You know, there's something to that because I think within the Protestant world, we're so devoid of images that as we live our lives, there are no images calling us back to Christ quite often. We have the Word, we have the Bible, but uh, we grew up suspicious of the images, so we almost left them all behind. Right, and, but then you look at the Gospel, and it's like, man, Jesus spits in a blind man's eye. You know, good grief, you know? How'd you like to get that? Or spits on his tongue or sticks his finger in his ear. So, I mean, he's always acting tangibly because, again, that's our nature. So there's no question that our senses can lie to us. There's no, t no question that sometimes we can use our senses in sinful ways. I mean, we're surrounded by a hypersexed culture, so we have to be careful. But the senses were God's gift. So I shouldn't mistrust them. I just got to ask the Lord to keep redeeming them. Misconception, again, this for the, one of the harshest criticisms would be uh, of the Mass, that whole idea of, uh, you know, critics are going to say, but don't you re-sacrifice Jesus Christ at the Mass every time? And doesn't that seem to be like you're forcing Christ to do it over, you know, over and over again? Yes, this is all a ruse. I actually have a, a white garment that I put on and I pull out nails and a hammer and I pound. No, of course not. Um, we know Hebrews, okay? He was sacrificed once and for all. It's done with. What happens at the Mass is not a, um, a bloody sacrifice. Rather, what it is is a representation, as opposed to a representation, a representation of Christ once and for all sacrifice, which happened on, on Calvary, huh? for us in an unbloodied manner. Is it still a sacrifice? Yes, of a completely different kind than any of us can imagine. That's what we would say. Mm. Is it sacrificial? Yes, because it's his same sacrifice, but now it's in an unbloodied way, so it's somehow not the same sacrifice. <laughs> That's why we're talking about the nature of a sacrament here, which is um, that God uses material things in such a way that he fills them to make divine events present. So, no, he's not sacrificed. Again, we don't slaughter Jesus on the cross. Um, the host doesn't drip. Um, what happens is, and, and this all goes back, and, and again, I know your knowledge of Hebrew and whatnot, and the, for the Jews, when they celebrate Passover, it's a remembrance. Uh, the, 
do this in remembrance of me. The psalm says, it's Psalm 111, I think, where it says, the Lord has established a memorial for himself. Well, the word there in Greek, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, is the Lord has established an anamnesis mm -hmm. for himself, which is the word that Jesus uses in the Last Supper when he says, do this in anamnesis of right. me, uh, do this in remembrance of me. Well, as an American, we think of, you know, remember. It's like, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. It's this really vague, kind of ambiguous sense of trying to think about something that happened a long time ago. That's not remembering for a Jew by any stretch of the imagination. The Passover isn't, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. The Passover for a devout Jew is, we're coming out of Egypt tonight. It's a total re-engagement Absolutely. in the truth of that event. We're, we're being liberated from bondage tonight. Wow. And there's urgency in it. There's there's all, all the senses, the exactly. passion, and that's what we, commitment. When we're gathered around the altar, that's what we would say is, is exactly what the Lord has established for himself, because just like God gave the institution for the Passover through his mediator, Moses, so the Lord himself in the flesh gives to the apostles the words for the Last Supper, which he commands them, keep on doing this. That in the Greek, that's an imperative. Do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. You must do this in remembrance of me. And Paul says, as often as you do this, you proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. So what are we doing? We are, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would say, the very sacrifice of Christ on the cross, it's like it, we now become contemporaries of it. It's again like uh, any event in the past where when we think about it, you know, you look at a photo on your desk or you see a picture from Kenya when you were there and, and somehow the event becomes present to you and you're contemporary to the event. Well, you're doing that through your mind and imagination. We would say that in the Mass, it's actually happening in a sacramental way, that somehow sacramentally, I'm at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. Somehow sacramentally, I'm at the empty tomb. Somehow sacramentally, I'm with the Lord in heaven. All because it's His doing, because yeah. He wants that to happen. That's what we would say. Mm -hmm. So we would say the Eucharist is truly Jesus. Uh, he's, he's, really, he's substantially there, but he's hidden himself. Just like he hid himself under the appearance of flesh, and he was really flesh, but he wasn't only man. So we would say that the Lord has chosen to hide himself under the appearance of bread and wine, but he's, he's not really... It's not really bread and wine. It just looks like it. That's why we would call it transubstantiation. The substance has changed, mm -hmm. even though the accidents remain. Is it literally him? No. It's sacramentally him. If Jesus were to walk into the church while Mass was going on, he wouldn't look like a host. We'd be down on our face by his majesty. Mm. It's fantastic. I think it's. Uh, I think the power of that image is uh, be great for every Christian to hear that, hear that explanation. I think that's why. That's why it's so. When you really, when you really understand, I didn't have a clue what was going on. Even when I was in seminary, I used to get bored out of my mind at mass. Why? Because the liturgies are often boring. I'm a priest, I can say that for a crying out loud. Our liturgies are prophetic sometimes, okay? If, I mean, we got the whole majesty of God here, and, you know, we're singing a couple of songs, and, you know, people are looking around, and they're trying to... I mean, if we knew what was going on, it, we would be in sheer awe and delight. Mm -hmm. So if I, can, if I can truly understand, I'm trying to help people understand the St. Anastasia. When we gather here, this, we're all contemporaries of this. And then we're sent out to tell the people what we just witnessed and who was just here. Now, how do I stay private about that? How do I not tell you about the man who gave his life for me? The God who became man and suffered and died and rose. How do I, how do I just say, yeah, it was kind of cool, you know, I don't know. I don't want to intrude in your life or, you know, force something down. I mean, how dumb can you be? <laughs> oh, it's super. Let's talk about Mary. In terms of learning, is there something for us to learn? To, you know, this misconception, uh, is it a misconception? Do Catholics worship Mary? Yes, it's a misconception. Because, you know, I mean, I grew up, man, I, it's like, we just, any reference to Mary, we'd like, <laughs> cut it out of the Bible. And I was close. I mean, I grew up, 
um, having no relationship with Mary. You know, my dad's very devout Catholic. Um, I had um, probably a lot of misconceptions about the role of Mary. Um, because we were a mix of Protestants and Catholics in the home, um, usually when that happens, the Catholic stuff goes. Because it's the Catholic stuff that would tr tend to intrude, you know. So you're not going to take your cross off the wall. We're going to take the crucifix off the wall. We're not going to, you know, the rosary goes. So I didn't know how to pray the rosary when I went to seminary, you know, which is a, a very strong devotion in the Catholic Church. I pray it every day now. It's just the Hail Mary, which comes right from Luke. Um, with a couple other prayers connected to it. So I had the same thing. In fact, when I was in the seminary, I had to just say, uh, Lord, you know, I, I keep hearing all this talk about I need to have a relationship with Mary. I don't have one. So if you really want it, um, can you help me out a little bit here? <laughs> so we do not worship her. We worship God alone. Um, we do honor her. Just like... Um, you honor your two friends who are back in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we do uh, as persons. We honor those, I mean, you see it, unfortunately, all too often in just sports or entertainment, you know? So we're, we're gonna honor people who made pictures that, movies that none of us would ever go to see, but somehow we're gonna tell them they were great works of art. We honor them, you know? We honor somebody who's 6'9", who can dunk. I mean, if we honor those people for doing really for doing things which have nothing to do with character, then how much more do we honor the saints, both alive and dead? So for, for a Protestant to say, I have a little relationship with Jesus, that's a normal, but to have a relationship with Mary, that'd be unusual. Would, and and, and I'm, I'm really looking to understand this too. Uh, is, is it to have a relationship with Peter as well? Yeah. To be, in, to be engaged with, with the history of our faith? Yeah, because our, our claim history? would be that the saints are not dead. Right, they're not. Which would be yours. So, and, and it's not like, you know, we're consulting, you know, we're going to mediums and putting our hands over a crystal ball going, okay, Peter, tell me the answer to the question, you know, or give me the magic number to the lotto, Mary. <laughs> no, it's a simple thing of the communion of saints for a Catholic is not broken by death, mm. we would hold. I hope not. So, therefore, I can ask, just like I ask you to pray for me, and you don't say, why would you bother to ask me to pray for you? Just talk to Jesus. What do I need to pray for you for? Well, you would, you would never think of saying that to somebody. You know, why would you bother to ask me to intercede for you? You don't need to ask me to intercede for you. Just go right to him. What would I possibly do for you? Well, we would say that that, that same principle holds for asking those who, according to Revelation, are standing around the throne of God in glory. We ask them to pray for us. And they know what, in fact, we need to receive because somehow the perspective from heaven seems to be a little bit better than our perspective here on earth. Mm -hmm. So the simple fact that they're not dead means I can have some sort of, it's a very different friendship than the one you and I could have, but some sort of relationship. We ask them to intercede. Well, they're part of the great cloud of witnesses still. Who exactly. Are... God is the God of the living, not the dead. Yeah, that's awesome. So we, we honor showing. Mary and we honor Mary highly because it's by her act of faith. Huh? her total surrender to the Lord. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Do to me whatever you want. Yeah. That is faith epitomized. It doesn't get any better than that for a human creature. And by her obedience, huh? by her obedient surrender, the serpent's head's been crushed. Mm -hmm. Do we owe her thanks for that? Because she could have said no. Because Eve did. Yeah. And Mary, the early church, always saw, huh, was the new Eve, mm -hmm. just like Christ is the new Adam. Yeah. Mary could have said no. She didn't say no. So by her yes, um, we've, we don't know how we would have got a redeemer otherwise. Mm -hmm. So in, in Catholic art, those images you were talking about, oftentimes you'll see a scene of the Annunciation from Luke, huh, where Gabriel comes to Mary. And I'm always fascinated by this in art because... I don't, I don't think you can find an image in art where you won't see Mary on her knees reading scripture when the angel comes. Which tells me, even though the artist may not have known this, that's why Mary knows the Lord. See, Mary's a woman who knows how God has interacted over and over and over 
with so the people of the Old Testament. She's prepared to respond when the time comes. Yeah, she knows God's faithful. She knows He provides. She doesn't know everything that's going to happen, but she knows He's faithful. She sees over and over again in what it is that He's revealed in Scripture that God intervenes in history. That's what He does. So when He comes, I'm ready to say yes. Mm. So that's the model for me, too, to be a person who knows. We have to be careful that we know the Lord. We don't just know about Him. And I know Him. I meet Him huh? by immersing myself in Scripture. Because that's what Protestant or Catholic, when the light comes on, when a person experiences Jesus Christ somewhere, it becomes the most vivid moment of your life. Yep. When all the rest was wrote. It was you just mailing it in. And, and it can happen just about anywhere. But... But for us as Protestants, we weren't open for that to happen to us through Mary. <laughs> even we were very though, afraid of it. Even though Scripture says, all generations will call me blessed. Yeah. So I got, I got honor. That's right. But I, 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 don't, I don't worship anybody but the one who made her. Well, let's, let's talk about reverence, reverence for God. I think that the Protestant model has been, particularly the loose, looser end of it, uh, referring to God as the man upstairs or seeing Jesus as my buddy. Mm -hmm. You know, she'd make a doll, you know, yeah. a Jesus doll, my buddy, buddy doll. my buddy. Yeah. And um, that's a pretty grim, I mean, part of that's a pretty grim way of looking at Jesus. When the real Jesus shows up, it's, it's different. I think that's something we need to learn from you. Um, yeah, Catholics can go to the other extreme, but I think the sense of, I mean, we just... Um, I was taught reverence, you know, fear of the Lord. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, huh? I mean, to, to really have a, uh, not like, oh, I'm, I'm scared of God, but, oh, I'm in the presence of God. Um, this, is, this is not my best friend in the sense of how I would have a, a buddy here. This is the God who says I want a star and there's a star. Oh. So, you know, like in Scripture over and over, you see, I will put my hand over my mouth as if to say, I'm in the presence of someone very different right now. Mm -hmm. We just grew up that way. I have a, mm -hmm. a, a priest friend of mine who studied with um, a German who was a nuclear physicist before he was a priest. They were in Rome together. And um, I think this is a great image for reverence and fear of God. He asked him one time, he says, have you ever seen the inside of a nuclear reactor? And my friend says, no. <laughs> and he says, oh, you should see it. And he describes it. You know, I'm, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but near as I can recall, the very simplistic explanation was you got the core in the center of the reactor, and then it's surrounded by this water, which is this extraordinary color blue. And then all that's kind of kept in by this very thick glass, which keeps the reaction going. And he says, uh, you realize that if the glass breaks, you would be dead in less than an instant. And my friend says, yeah, where are you going with this? And the man says, you should remember that the next time you walk past the tabernacle. So as a Catholic, when we walk into church, we're somehow trying to balance two things, familiarity, but not casualness, because we would hold that the pure power of God is there, all cloaked under the appearance of bread so that I would dare to get near. But it's the pure power of God who made the universe. So that's why when, uh, in the way that we talk of the Lord, and particularly in the way that we walk into a church or something like that, it's very different. Um, but I learned that from, I mean, I learned the vocabulary from my brother-in-laws who were not Catholic. I mean, so, because you can certainly, I mean, you, you can find people on both sides here. You can find Catholics who don't have a clue what to do in a church, and they, they are overly casual. Yeah. Or they do talk about Jesus in the kind of language that you did too. And we, we, we want familiarity, huh? we want intimacy. Right. But man, it's God. <laughs> it's, it's God. And he's, he's not man. Well, it makes sense, it makes sense if you think of the best homes, the, the homes that are families that are filled with the most laughter are also the homes where people treat each other with the greatest amount of respect and dignity. The, 
funny, you know, where, where the funniness, the humor comes out of a sense of tremendous loyalty and honor. Um, I've always thought about it because at times I've, I've seen myself flippant with my children and I realize how damaging that is. When I honor them, see them with dignity, then the same thing happens. And when you talk about the host or you talk about the image of Jesus, Jesus comes, came in weakness and you don't think of Jesus as the, the cloak over a nuclear reactor where if to, to experience the real God is to be overwhelmed. In Paul can't talk about it. You know, Paul's caught up to third heaven. He doesn't have a language for it. <laughs> so how do I, how do we, my encounter, you know, is whatever the encounter was where I saw the Lord in the car. I mean, I, aside from what I told you, I can't talk about it. I mean, it's, it was this sheer presence of I'm somehow in the presence of God. And when you're in the presence of God, um, if you stand for the President of the United States, for crying out loud, or you get quiet when a dignitary walks into a room, then I would think you'd, you'd certainly do something more for the Creator who made the dignitary. Okay. I've got one loose, let me get this loose question out of the way, and then, then I want to get into confession. When Catholics you want to go to confession? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I need it. When Catholics pray to Mary and the saints, do, do they, the saints, answer the prayers? That's what, again, as Protestants always beefing about the... When I ask you to pray for me, do you answer my prayers? Of course not. Same answer. It's pretty easy. Yeah, it really is. Of course not. But it's inviting people. It's living in... It's almost an expression to say we don't live in just an earthly community. We live in a, a heavenly community now. We're seated with Christ. Colossians says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Exactly. So, yeah, it, it's another one of those really gross misconceptions. I mean, maybe Catholics don't know the answer to it either. <laughs> but of course not. Yeah. The Lord answers the prayer. That's terrific. Okay, confession. Um, it's the power of hearing someone say you're forgiven. Uh, the misconception about, I think we have a lot to learn about confession. I think, we, I think the, the Protestant church has, in the, in the, the emergence of small groups in the last 20 years was the same. We need to have more of this. But the misconceptions out there is, does the priest forgive a person's sins and not God when they're confessing? I know what you're going to say. No, you're not. But what, what's happening there? and what, what do we learn from that? Well, let, let's look at scripture uh, real quick. John 20. What a concept. A Catholic? I know. Come on, brother. This is Get in great, the word. Man. This is awesome. Yeah. Okay, so John 20, huh? So this is this is this is the first these are the first words out of Jesus' mouth on the day of the resurrection. Okay. A day that the triumph over sin. You know, the destruction of sin and death. First words out of his mouth. Peace, that's the first thing he says, which is worth hearing if you're one of the apostles who's abandoned and run away, because right. now he's back and you've got to be a little concerned. So peace. And then verse 21 continues, as the Father has sent me. Even so I send you. What did, what did the Father send the Son to do? To reconcile the world to himself. Huh? And when he had said this, he breathed on them, which is clearly going back to Genesis 2, when God breathes into Adam and makes him a living being. So Man, John... Imagine being there for that. Absolutely. So John, just like he does in John 1, yeah. he's, you know, he's, where he's playing on Genesis, he's clearly going back to Genesis again here. And we're seeing a new creation. Jesus on the day of the resurrection is recreating humanity. He breathes on them. Mm -hmm. And he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is to the 12, to the 11. In verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So the very day when Jesus triumphs over sin, somehow there's also this kind of stark, sober reality that people are going to keep falling. Mm. And I'm giving to you my authority to free them. So if he gives them and says to them, if, you for, if he gives them the authority to forgive sins, this is Jesus doing this. Pretty clearly, the implication is somebody's going to be coming and acknowledging them. Right. That's confession. So the question as all these questions often have to do with, is authority. It's, it's really not a... People go to confession all the time. I mean, Oprah's confession. <laughs> you know, guys going on a bar on Friday night, 
Interest. Oh, I can't believe what I did. That's yeah. confession. I mean, there's a human, there's a psychological need. It's just like the body throws up when it's sick. The spirit throws up when it's sick. I have to tell somebody. So the issue is not confession. The issue is priesthood. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Does someone have authority to forgive sins, authority received from God? Scripture pretty clearly seems to imply the answer to that is yes. Yes. Uh, I, I tell you, as a confessor, I'm a, I'm a confessee and a confessor, huh? It's no great joy to just listen to sin. Um, we certainly don't get a kick out of this. Mm. It, as a priest, it's this somehow, somehow almost a mystical sense of getting this little tiny glimpse of what the Lord has died for. That. As Paul says, how Christ became sin. How he made him to be sin who knew no sin. And, and we get a glimpse of that, not only from our own lives, huh, from what we've done wrong, but just hearing sin after sin. But then to see somebody, because again, we're sensual. Huh? We experience reality through the senses. And to hear the words of forgiveness and to see somebody actually begin to physically sit up and know that I've, they know that they've personally acknowledged what they've done and that the Lord has given them mercy and they've heard it. So I don't have to convince myself that the God's presence of me. Jesus in that encounter. Absolutely. Because all the sacraments for us as Catholics is it's the Lord doing it. So who's, who's forgiving sins? Jesus is. Who's baptizing? Jesus is. Who's confirming you? Jesus is. Hmm. Let me ask you a personal question just related to that before we move on. In hearing confessions and the burden of you talked about the cross being heavy. Um, obviously, from my vantage point of being a Protestant, being a lot of people, Kensington, I don't even understand it, but the priesthood of all believers, mm -hmm. of the, a sense of sharing the load, sharing the load of the cross at times for you and the, the leadership or the centrality of the priest is such a huge responsibility. Do you ever feel like buckling under the weight of that? Um, no, I think it more in, in Paul's words where he says, you know, who, is, um, who, who, doesn't, who stumbles and I don't burn, you know, that I'm not scandalized. So we are, in, it's not an image to say we're the body of Christ, not all of us. We, we really are organically connected. And when one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. Um, we, we carry each other's burdens. I know we all do that. I think as a priest, I'm, I'm so conscious of how many people pray for me by name. Mm -hmm. You are too. Sure, yes. I, I don't know what I'd possibly, I don't know how I would, yeah. yeah, for one, I'm just I'm in sheer gratitude to the people who do it. Two, I don't know how I would possibly continue without that. I can't even imagine where I would be without the prayers of others. Mm -hmm. so. Does the priest forgive a person's sins and not God? No, God does. God gives his authority, as we can see in John 20, to the priest, uh, as Christ gave the authority to the apostles, to loosen sin or to retain it. So can a priest ever forgive if he's, um, he can't extend that agency unless he's, he can do it even if he's, uh, even, if the sin, even if the priest is a, is a sinner, is fallen, if he's still operating in the agency of the priesthood, he's still... Yeah, Stending because the, the grace. Exactly, because the sacraments don't depend upon the grace of the person who's, who's dispensing it, because it's Christ who's forgiving, okay? Only God can forgive sins. That's terrific. Talk to me for just a few minutes about, if anything, <laughs> what Catholics can learn from Protestants. Hmm. <laughs> End of interview? <laughs> um, well, obviously, we can learn a lot. I think one of the things... A couple things right off the bat. Evangelization. And um, Explain that. Even Kensington people be confused by that. Just explain what you mean by that. Like, how do I share my faith? You know, again, Catholics, because for so many Catholics, their life is uh, almost a devotional life, for, especially for the older Catholics. Not necessarily, but oftentimes. Um, they're just not accustomed. It feels awkward to somehow just tell you about Jesus mm -hmm. at work. Now, I see... Because that's the job of the priest. That's in, what in, many in, people thought. Yeah. That's what many people thought. And I've been trying like crazy to tell them, no. In fact, the Vatican II, again, the council in the 60s, said that the primary role of the laity, okay, so those who are not ordained, 
is to be about the work of evangelization and sanctification. So it's the task of the laity to renew the world. Because yeah. I'm not in the workplace anymore. And, and they expect me to say something about you know, abortion or they expect me to say something about scripture. Or they, I'm a priest for crying out loud. They don't expect you to say that because you're just at the photocopier at work with a cup of coffee yeah. waiting for some copies. So if you say it in the midst of that environment, all of a sudden it hits people in a different way because they're not expecting it from you. So Catholics are just kind of, we're kind of going through some growing pains, I think, um, at least one generation is, of I want to do this, but I don't know how to do it. And I think I learned it in large part, I learned it from my dad who was Catholic, but I also learned it from my sisters and my brother-in-law who were very strong evangelicals. We could learn that from you. Cool. The other thing we could learn is really how to worship. I don't think Catholics, we have one aspect of worship that maybe you don't or that we can help you grow on in the sense of the reverence and whatnot as we come to mass and things like that. But um, you know, there's, a, there's a book written years ago called Why, Can't, Why Catholics Can't Sing. <laughs> I mean, it's like I, my challenge to people is always, you know what, guys, I saw you yesterday at U of M Stadium. There were 105,000 of you, and you left horse. You sang the national anthem. You sang the Michigan fight song. You sang, or the U of MSU fight song. You sang whatever. You left horse. Have you ever walked out of church horse? So what happens all of a sudden? I know you can sing. Why don't you sing in here? <laughs> so... And some of that, I think, is just this familiarity and being at ease with all things spiritual mm. that Catholics often don't have. We don't, we don't seem to make, we seem to compartmentalize life more so than many evangelicals. Like, yeah, I'm Catholic, but it's a segment of my life. Mm. You know, it's like, a, it's like a, a, sh a book on the shelf, as opposed to, for me, in my experience uh, growing up of evangelicals was, no, my faith was like the whole bookcase. That's right. That's Everything else just fit into the bookcase, exactly. So we need to learn that more. I mean, how do, I, how do I really live my identity as a disciple of the Lord? Really understanding who I am in Christ. And uh, well, it's great seeing it happen. Is there anything else that comes to your mind? I'm thinking, uh, wondering about spiritual gifts. Like? I'm just thinking, um, growing up in my experience, it seemed like the teaching on spiritual gifts or inviting people to use the spiritual gifts. Has that always been a part of the Catholic experience? No, it, it was my experience growing up because uh, in the Catholic Church there's what's known as the charismatic renewal. It's a movement that started uh, back in the 60s and it's kind of grown in different places in the world um, where the spiritual gifts are really highly emphasized. So I mean I grew up in a house where we spoke in tongues, you know, we prayed in tongues. We, I saw my mom healed miraculously of a debilitating disease. I saw legs grow. I mean, I saw people slain in the spirit repeatedly. I heard prophecies, I gave prophecies, I've seen interpretation of tongues. So, I mean, I saw that growing up. Um, that's not a normal Catholic experience, but it is a normal Catholic experience of someone who lives in the charismatic renewal. Mm -hmm. I think in the, in the Catholic Church, oftentimes there's, um, like we can learn from you something more about who the Holy Spirit is. I think. Catholics, uh, like the power of the Holy Spirit that just changed hearts and convicted men and women and um, led them to repent and gave them power in all the different ways that he gave them power. Catholics are often just clueless about the Holy Spirit. But you know what, that was true even of the, you know, my Protestant church growing up. I and mean, if the Holy Spirit would have ever really shown up in power, people would have freaked out. I think you think of the charismatic renewal, the influence of people really experiencing dynamically the presence of the Holy Spirit has, has rolled like a shockwave over the Protestant and the Catholic world. In fact, the church all across the world has had an amazing flood of impact. It's interesting to see that that was part of your experience growing up. Yeah, it was used to freak me out, but <laughs> but yeah, it was part of my experience. We talked about the Bible, reading the Bible. Yeah, although I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how to answer that in the sense of whether we would learn from you how to read the scripture. I think we, we've grown. Have we got more to grow as Catholics? Yeah, by all means. 
Um, Catholics are somehow just reluctant, uh, a certain segment anyway, to, to just open up scripture and, and to let them talk. You know, like I'm always telling people, inspiration doesn't just mean that God breathes the scriptures. It means yeah. that, it also means that God continues to breathe out of the scriptures mm -hmm. onto me when I read them. Right. You know, so every time I'm reading them, He's speaking to me. I should never say, I don't hear God when I pray. That tells me you're not reading the Bible. Because every time I read the Bible, He's talking to me. So maybe, I don't know how you teach us this, but one of the ways you teach us this is by the fact that you carry a Bible with you all the time. Um, Catholics are beginning to do that a little bit more, but... And you're modeling that to people. Well, we're trying to, yeah. but, but they still, it, it's foreign. You know, I got to tell them to get a Bible, first of all. You know, they got these big family heirloom Bibles that, you know, sit on the coffee table. They're, they're a great, you know, bookend, yeah. but it's pretty inconvenient to read in bed. It's hard. So um, your, your witness that way for us is very helpful, and it hopefully it just provokes us to go, man, why don't I have a, a Bible like that with my name on it, mm -hmm. which shows that, because Catholics are always buying cheap Bibles. You know, I mean, there's no leather, but buy a leather, buy a good Bible for crying out loud. You know, spend some money. Don't get chintzy all of a sudden on the Word of God when you just spent $40,000 on a car. Yeah. So um, you help us in that way, and, and hopefully you can continue. You are a truly evangelical. Yeah. <laughs> you really are, man. <laughs> You're unbelievable. Uh, that's great. Um, one of the big things uh, growing up, and again, this is, would be a criticism, but the whole idea of, Inviting people to make a conscious, personal commitment to Jesus Christ was a was common Protestant language, but don't remember hearing that a lot in the Catholic uh, communion. But I, I seem to be hearing it more now. Uh, Is that be, be interesting to see your reaction to this? Devout evangelical came to visit me one time. She wanted to get money from me to give to the missions, and um, at one point she looks at me. I'm a priest. And she looks at me. She says, "Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus?" And I looked at her and I says, well, you know, I, I put his flesh and blood in my mouth every morning. <laughs> and she looked at me and went, <sighs> and I thought, I don't know how much more personal it can get than that. Yeah. So um, the, the part of the problem in the discussion is at the that language. Moment, at that moment, she knew exactly how the disciples yeah. felt in John 6, right? When <laughs> Jesus was talking. She walked away. Yeah. yeah. She walked away. She didn't, she didn't ask for any money after that. She, she looked at me like, oh, it was, you know, strange. Um, so uh, the challenge here again is oftentimes what, what doesn't happen is what you and I are doing. So you say that, well, what do you mean by that? The Catholic will hear a language coming from the Protestant or vice versa, and we don't have any way to process the language that the other one's using. Mm -hmm. So we just filter it through what we think you're saying, mm -hmm. as opposed to shattering and, and actually taking the time to, to get in here and have the discussion. That personal relationship phrase in the Protestant world has become almost as, as much of a stumbling block to people really experiencing Jesus. For some people, it's like, okay, I have the personal relationship, and it becomes a, almost a rote saying, but you haven't experienced an encounter with the living God who defies description and has been revealed through Jesus Christ. Yeah, and was it sufficient to have had a, you know, an encounter with him 32 years ago? Yeah. I, I got to have an encounter with him every day because you know, I don't want to stumble. I have to choose every, it's, to me it's the burden of being free, <laughs> that I have to choose again every morning to commit myself to Him. Not that that's a drudgery, it's not by any means, it's a joy, but there's times when the flesh, you know, the, 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 the man who is hostile to the things of God isn't looking to carry the cross. And I got to choose again there to follow Him. So we have to keep doing that. And, One of the things that people at Kensington know uh, is that God's working at St. Anastasia through friends and people we've known for a long time. You want to talk about that a little bit? Um, it's, it's kind of awkward to talk about only in the sense of I can only comment from what I see and the people who come to me. Um, Brag for a minute. It's okay. No, we'll I, give you permission. Well, it isn't me. You know, just like you're, man, Kensington isn't you. It's all God. Um, Again, I'm fortunate to have followed after a couple of great priests who served as pastors here. So I'm the third pastor in this parish. Um, and we've all just kind of built on each other. I think what, what I've personally seen is people begin to have this personal encounter, whether it's coming to know that when I come to Mass, 
I'm really meeting the Lord. I'm listening to him speak to me in his word. I'm encountering him in the Eucharist. Uh, a greater desire to read his word at home. I mean, my, my challenge to people has been to pray an hour a day um, in a block, not 10 minutes, six times a day, in a block. Mm. And just watching people begin to do that and seeing their change and the transformation that's going on inside them. And the, I think the, what's happened from what I've seen from the people who come talk to me is they don't simply know about God, they're coming to know him. And that's a world of difference. It's the most exciting thing in the world. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's all I want out of life is I want people to fall in love with the one that I love. Mm. So to see that happen is, as you know, is just extraordinary when you just watch someone all of a sudden get that contagion that is, I think I just met the Lord in a way I've never met him before. Mm. And everything's new. That's what I'm seeing. Hunger is what I'm seeing. So our mission is coming up, and the title of the mission is, I want God. Mm. That's all I want, because he's the only thing that will satisfy me. So people everywhere are wanting. Yep. Yeah. We're seeing it here, too, so we're, praise, praise God for that. Terrific. Um, for some people that watch this interview, uh, some of the Protestants, they are genuinely going to be disappointed that, that um, I didn't try to try harder to poke holes in things you were saying, or that you didn't press me harder, or smack me around a little bit more. Um, but I, I just I want you to know that I am I am I just uh, in going through this interview, I felt so proud to be your brother in Christ. Likewise. I mean, deeply moved in my heart to to just celebrate that and to know that you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, that you are talking about his resurrection, that you are, you are with me in this. You are my full partner. And um, I don't know if you feel that fully or completely. I, I, I hope you feel that way about me, but I, um, I'm just grateful to be in the, in the kingdom and serving Christ with you. Yeah, I would, I would ditto all of that by all means. It's a, you know, how, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell in unity. And while, while we may not have between the two places um, as great a unity as we might want, hopefully people are coming to understand we've got a lot more unity than we thought. Mm -hmm. And we can rejoice that we're standing side by side in the midst of a world which is longing to know the Lord um, and trying to help people find Him. And if we can't love each other, they're, they're going to just That's blow right. us off in an instant. That's right. The world laughs because of the names we call each other. Mm. The stupid Christians, they can't even get their act together. Why should I go join <laughs> exactly. one of them? So yeah, it's a great joy to, it's nice to know that you're up in the north and that the people there are getting fed through the word of God. And uh, it gives me a lot of comfort. Cool. When you think as a Catholic, uh, as a Catholic follower of Christ or of Catholics that you've interact with, where are they most often wounded by well-meaning Christians who are outside the Catholic faith, people from Kensington or wherever, are there common patterns of wounding that are still taking place where we hmm. lack of respect or, or mistrust? That's you know, still... I, I think one of the, uh, I just got done talking to a woman who's, uh, who's becoming Catholic, who's got, getting letters from all sorts of people trying to save her from joining the Antichrist. Still hearing that. Still hearing that. And it always strikes me as, you know, we talk about uh, welcoming each other as brothers and sisters, huh? Someone can move from the Baptist church to the Presbyterian church to the Lutheran church to the Methodist church to the Episcopalian church. And, you know, there's always a sadness in seeing you leave the community, but it's, hey, God bless you, brother. You know, I'm happy you're finding the Lord. You step foot in here and you've apostatized. Hmm. Um, where does that come from? You know, how is it that all of a sudden the church unity, and it really doesn't matter where you go to church on Sunday, unless where you go to church on Sunday is Catholic. Where did that go? Because at the root of that is, is that old stuff that we were talking about in the earlier generations of people are still thinking that the other person's not a Christian. That's right. And how dare you? There's a tremendous evil of self-righteousness and of 
the judgmental heart that is that's wounded everybody. Everybody's carried that wound. And, and we've done it too, you know, unfortunately. That's... I hope we can dent into that even in this interview at Hope's Kensington. So I'd love for you just to, you know, if there's a word of challenge or a word of exhortation or uh, anything you'd love to say to the, the Kensington community, the believers there, and not just believers, but people that are struggling with who Christ is. I mean, I'd, I'd love for you just even to share a few thoughts. If you, you know, you're not going to be there either, either weekend. What are your thoughts for us when you speak, when you just, as a, as a brother in Christ, as a Catholic priest, as a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ, Give us some thoughts or challenge, your final word. Well, I give you the same challenge that I gave to us here, which is, um, are, are, you, are you praying sufficiently? The answer to that has to be no. None of us are praying enough. Um, what's enough? I mean, in the, in the Gospels, Jesus' exhortation in the garden high is, could you not keep a watch one hour with me? Um, and that's always had kind of a particular importance, that, that length of time um, in the Catholic Church. That's the origin of what's known as the holy hour. So, I mean, I challenge you guys to pray an hour every day and to just really give God that time. Give it in scripture, give it in interceding for others, give it in praising him, do whatever. But um, to hear, I, I encourage people, it'll probably be every bit as awkward as a blind date. Because after a while, hmm. you kind of like, so <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> you know, because you kind of run out of things to say often. Yeah. Because people, even though we're in the language of praising God all the time, when we come to worship, are we doing sufficient in actually just sitting down with the Lord and listening? And if you're not giving him an hour, I start giving him an hour. Um, that second be, thing, that'd be transformational for people. Absolutely. How does it not to spend an hour in the presence of the one who is life? How do I not get more life? Hmm. Second thing I would say in all charity as a brother and also to our people here is, um, to watch our mouths. James, who Luther didn't have any great love for, as we know, um, but which is inspired, has some great exhortations to us about speech. Mm -hmm. And God gave us the gift of speech to build up and to communicate truth and to encourage. And sometimes in, in the exchange of truth and, and encouraging, we have to say a harsh word. Huh? We have to, you're, you're a dad, you gotta, you gotta discipline, you gotta reprimand, you gotta say something. Um, but gossip and slander is of a completely different order. And out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. And it can't be. So my plea to people at Kensington uh, on behalf of speech, as my plea is here with our people, is um, to watch our speech about each other. Mm -hmm. um, we love the Lord here greatly. We're desiring him here greatly. Mm. Um, we know that's true at Kensington. I would humbly ask that you guys recognize it's true here. Um, you can't undo what's been said, mm. ever. And, and I don't have access to anybody else's heart, uh, nor does anyone have access to anyone else's. Um, that's between them and the Lord. So what's Let's try to continue to do some things together, please God, where we can, we can continue to shore up the unity mm -hmm. um, and to use the gift of speech in the way that God gave us. That means you and I are going to go at it at times. That's fine. We'll go at it. But we'll do it as brothers. Right. Uh, so let's, let's try to do that. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I'll always honor you. I hope so too. In your presence <laughs> or your absence. Yeah. And I hope the Kensington people do that for St. Anastasia. In fact, I, I hadn't planned to do this, but I, I'd love, I'd love on, on film, just on the camera, I'd love for you to say a prayer for the people of Kensington, and then I'm going to pray for the people of St. Anastasia. Great. I'd love to, yeah. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, all the work that you're doing in the people at Kensington. I thank you for my brothers and sisters there who have come to know you and to know your love revealed in your son and the power of your spirit. Thank you for uh, the work of my brother Steve and all the gifts that you've given to him and all those on the pastoral staff who care for the people there. Lord, I ask that you would use them as a, 
a true means of renewal in their families and in their workplaces. May their faith be uh, truly contagious to all those who see them and interact with them. Help them to perceive something different in them. And to know the difference is you. Lord, I just ask your blessings uh, on all the activities that they're doing. May it all be for your glory and your honor and for the building up of the kingdom. And I ask all that through Jesus, who is your Son and our Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for um, this fantastic privilege today to be with Father John. I'm grateful for his leadership in this community. I'm so grateful for, for the scars on his heart. I'll never forget that. Lord, I pray for every person at St. Anastasia that, that the scar tissue would be there, that it would be so clear that you own their lives. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing in this church. Thank you for each brother and sister. And may you expand the territory of this ministry. May you raise men and women up to serve you in ways they never dreamed possible. I pray too that um, we'd be inspired by Father John's exhortation today to spend an hour a day with you, to hear from you, to let that love grow, to experience your presence. Thank you for the fact that uh, our time today has been a little piece of heaven, what heaven will be like. We look forward to all that you're going to do in the days ahead. Increase our faith to see what it is you'd like to do in our lives. We pray this in the glorious name of Jesus. I think the glory that we've sensed today from, from Father John as he's just shared with us uh, to gain a clearer picture always of who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. It's been fantastic. Yeah, it's good to be with you.